Good evening all and welcome. Tonight I have a collection of paranormal stories for your listening pleasure, so get comfortable and let the darkness take control. Growing up, my family became acquainted with this husband and wife who bought an old Victorian home my parents originally looked at when we moved to the area. My parents hit it off really well with them, and my family basically helped these two friends of ours fix up the place and completely remodeled it together over the span of a few years. Really great people who my family have loved and trusted for decades. They're practically family, and they don't have kids, so it's like they've been my aunt and uncle for most of my life now. My parents are from the deep south, and always joked with their friends about the home they purchased being super haunted. The wife, Terry, and the husband, Dan, both grew up in the Catholic Church, and held a lot of resentment towards it and were agnostic. They didn't believe in any of the stuff my parents joked about, and openly mocked the idea of it, for as long as they could at least. For the first few months that Terry and Dan moved in, they actually had to live on the first floor of the home, because it was the only room that was suitable with this small room off the kitchen, which was on the back of the house. This was actually a servant's quarter, and it was very creepy. It was small, had one door into it from the kitchen, and one door out to the back of the house to the backyard. The strangest part was that it had this wooden spiral staircase in a closet. One of the closet doors in the room opened to a small spiral staircase that was entirely enclosed in this dark space to the second and third floor. It was weird but not uncommon with a higher-end Victorian home that needed servants' quarters back in the day. Anyway, no one liked that staircase. After the first month or so, the staircase started making noises at night. It was mostly creaking and some squeaking that would wake both Terry and Dan up, but one night they woke up to footsteps and a loud cough coming from the closet staircase. They both thought it was an intruder, so Dan scrambled to the closet up the staircase with a flashlight and hammer, only to find nothing. He checked some of the exits at the top of the staircase into the unfinished upper floors, but there was nothing. When they told my parents, Dan told them there weren't any footprints on all the dusty steps of the stairs, and it was cold in there at night and chalked it up to the stairs expanding and making some old beams pop and squeak. They went back to bed that night, but every once in a while they'd wake up to the same thing, and Dan would go there to find nothing. We found out though that one time, Terry went up there with him, and she said that the upper floor rooms smelled heavily of tobacco and vanilla, and they had never smelled it that way during the day or before. Again, never any footsteps in the stair or the room they would check. Eventually, they ended up tearing out the staircase altogether, as it had some moisture damage. During that time, they were living on the first floor. There were some other issues going on with their dog. They had this little chihuahua who would regularly growl at the foot of the bed at night, growl and bark at the corners of the room day and night and often act very skittish when it was normally a very happy and fun-loving dog. They chalked it up to moving into this big new home, and having all this construction around, and thought nothing of it until one day, Terry was lounging in the front room watching TV, and she heard their dog whimpering. This is kind of hard to describe, but the first floor ceiling was over 10 feet tall, and many of the front rooms, including the foyer and dining room, were separated by these grand wooden sliding doors that joined together too close. She walked to the dining room and found her dog stuck between two of the wooden sliding doors that had been opened just long enough for the dog to fit halfway through. The dog was really happy though and wagging its tail, but when she got closer to it, she recoiled because she saw the dog's fur and skin moving back over and over like it was being petted. Then she noticed, through the gap in the doors, that the dog's front legs were in the air, 
and that it was like something was trying to pull it through. She yelled to the dog's name and immediately the dog's front legs dropped and she scurried out between the doors. This never happened again, but by this point Terry was freaked out and my parents stopped the ghost jokes entirely. But it gets worse. Way worse. A few years into remodeling this place, they have their first two floors nearly done and are living on the second floor, fixing up the basement and third story, before they move on to remodeling the outside of the house. During this time, things have calmed down for the most part. They still hear weird stuff at all times of the day, but it's a massive century-old home in the process of being remodeled. Noises happen. Terry and Dan are asleep at night on the second floor. The entire first floor is done, most of the second floor is finished, and at this point the house is starting to feel like a home. Terry wakes up in the middle of the night to very loud sounds coming from the first floor. It was music, lots of talking and laughing, basically it sounded like a huge party was going on. She doesn't remember what the music sounded like, just that it and the people laughing are talking downstairs and it was loud enough that she could feel the vibrations and resonance of the sounds directly below their bedroom. Then, it all just stops, and goes silent before she hears sounds, like there were a group of people walking up their grand staircase. This was a grand, wooden staircase that has two different landings. I think you call it cantilevered. It sounds like ten or more people are walking up the stairs together. By the time they make it to the first landing, it sounds like there are just a few people, and by the time the noise reaches the top of the stairs, it only sounds like two. Terry, as you can imagine, was scared to death, and threw her head under the covers as she heard the footsteps approach the bedroom, and then her stomach dropped when she heard the door creak open. It was quiet at first, but then all of a sudden she heard talking. She said it sounded like a conversation going on the radio that was too low to hear, and then was turned up to room volume. Once the voices were loud enough to understand, she quickly realized the voices were talking about her, and they were just at the foot of the bed. She said she heard the voices of two different women, one old, one young. They sounded angry. They were saying awful things about Terry, how she looked, how she acted, what she wore. They went on to say more awful things and how she needed to leave the house. Terry snapped at that moment and pulled the covers off her face and screamed her husband's name. When she pulled off the covers, she saw a short old woman and a tall homely woman looking, who was thin and in her thirties or forties. And just as she had seen them, suddenly, they weren't there. She said she only saw a flash of them but got a good enough look to see how mad they were. Next thing that happened was her husband rolling over and saying, Did you hear that? Dan apparently never heard the party downstairs, but from the moment the door opened he heard the full conversation the two women had about his wife. From that point on, Dan obviously knew something was going on but he was a really stoic guy and just ignored it. If you don't think about it, it doesn't exist. Terry was fully aware she wasn't going insane, and there was indeed something very wrong with the house that she had no explanation for, and she was scared to live there from that point on, and felt watched in every room she was in. So now we get to the worst night, and I honestly don't know if it's even the entire story, as Terry does not often tell it, and what I heard was from my mum when I was old enough to hear it. If I didn't mention it before, her husband Dan worked construction. He was a mason and was doing a job about an hour and a half away from town and ended up getting snowed in one winter during a bad blizzard we had in like 95, so this left Terry home alone that night during the blizzard just in the house with their two dogs. What I personally remember of this night was waking up at an hour that I wasn't allowed to be up because the front doorbell was having a fit which got our dogs barking. 
My dad happened to be out of town at the time too, so my mum went to the front door with a piston on our dog and turned on the front porch to see Terry in a coat and her nightgown and rubber boots in hysterics. Sitting at the top of the stairs in my Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle PJs, I heard mum opening the door and Terry wailing and crying before peeking down and seeing her collapsed with my mum holding and rocking her. I don't remember how much time passed that night, but I do remember Terry calmed down and some police officers came over. And that's when my mum checked on me and put me back in bed. So years later, when I was old enough, I asked mum about the story. And this is what my mum told me happened that night. Terry told her that she was in bed with their chihuahua and their second dog that they had gotten by now, which was a bigger chocolate lab. The house is mostly remodelled at this point, and they turned that second floor bedroom into their master bedroom. It was time for bed, and she was watching the news, when there was a loud boom, and the house shakes. It sounded like the ceiling fell out of one of the rooms in the house, which was something they were always concerned about. The dogs get spooked and run out the room into the hallway, barking, and as she's getting up out of bed to see what's happened, the door to the room just slams shut. She said there was an awful droning noise that hurt her ears, and the whole room filled with pressure, and every corner and edge of the room looked dark, like the room was lit, but for some reason the light wasn't reaching the entire room anymore. The TV started blaring static, her head was pounding, and she said the room just turned red, like someone snapped their fingers. I really have a hard time believing any of this, as I am an agnostic. But here's what she said happened next. She looks up at the light on the ceiling, and when the room turned red, she saw that the ceiling light was what had caused the change of colour in the room. It was an old wired chandelier, and had many electric candle holders, like bulbs on each spoke. Each candle bulb had changed into a Virgin Mary statuette glowing red. She screamed, and the statues began melting and dripping onto the bed. She was able to scramble to the door, and thankfully the door opened without a fuss. She ran downstairs, and when she made it to the second landing, something grabbed her and pushed her against the wall before she fell down the last few steps below the landing. She jumped into the boots and jacket next to the door, and ran out into the blizzard scared out of her mind, leaving the front door wide open and the dogs behind. We lived about a two minute drive from her home, so it was probably a little over a mile, and that was honestly one of the biggest blizzards I've ever seen in my life in the Midwest. She ran hysterical through all of that to our front door in the middle of the night before collapsing in our foyer. My mum was convinced there was an intruder. Terry had been assaulted, so my mum called the police who took a while to get there. The officers who responded called the police chief who lived a few streets down from Terry's home. He walked on over there in the storm and checked out the house and to see about the dogs. He said the front door was wide open and all the lights in the house were on. Every single one. Even the table lamps. He checked every room, every closet, walked the grounds around the house and found no prints in the snow besides his and Terry's. The only snow in the house was the one that he had tracked inside and what had accumulated at the entryway while the door was left open. The police brought the dogs over to our house later and Terry stayed at ours the rest of the night and the next day, until the roads were clear enough for Dan to make it back to town and pick up his wife. This really shook Terry up, and at this point they were ready to part with the house and take the loss. In a moment of desperation, she contacted the Catholic church in town for someone to come by and say some sermon or bring some holy water, who knows. She was desperate. They laughed at her and said they don't really do that stuff, and the ghosts aren't real, which I can't blame. The Presbyterian preacher in town, though, agreed to walk around the room saying some words from the Bible, and he did. When he was leaving, he asked Terry and Dan if they had asked the ghosts to leave yet. He said if you don't tell them you don't want them there, 
Maybe if you tell them that you don't want them there, they'll just leave. So they did. They went in every room and said that they wanted them gone and that if Terry and Dan didn't get to finish remodeling the house, the city was ready to condemn it and tear it down. And things stopped happening overnight. They ended up finishing the basement and that third story, and the last thing to do was finish up the outside of the house. When they wanted to get ideas for what to paint the front porch and second floor outside balcony, they had my sister take a bunch of pictures from the front and side of the house to visualize paint schemes. My sister had an older Minolta camera, so she had to get the film developed, and when she did, she noticed some startling things. And I actually got to see these pictures with my own eyes as a kid. My sister was freaking out about it before giving it to Terry and Dan. The front, first floor of the house, had this massive parlor with huge windows out to the front and side yard. The developed film showed both windows of the front parlor, and in it, you can see men in period clothes with bowler hats in multiple pictures. In the pictures taken from the front of the house, they are actually staring out at the camera. You could see their expressions in everything, and I remember thinking it was unreal at nine years old, and there was no way. But there it was. From the shots of the men in the parlor, it appeared that they were smoking or were shrouded in mist. We later learned that the room was a smoking parlor at one point. There was one other part of the house that revealed something in the developed film that was in the second floor outside balcony. The room that exited out onto that balcony from the second floor had a normal door and then a screened wooden storm door on the outside. In every single shot, my sister got off that balcony. There's a little girl in a large poofy dress with a big bow in her hair phased into the door, like she's stuck halfway through it. Nothing spooky happened anymore, but Terry and Dan were done with the remodeling at that point and were ready to get out of the home. Once the house was put on the market though, some of the stuff started up again. They would hear someone running around upstairs in the front room that had access to the outdoor balcony and sometimes Terry said she'd hear someone that sounded like a little girl humming to herself or bouncing a ball around that wasn't there. Of course, everyone decided it was the little girl from the photos that we took during the remodeling. So that's the story. I've got one more small thing we heard about happening after they sold the house though. I guess Terry ran into the family that bought the home at the grocery store later on. The lady who bought Terry's home actually asked if there was anything weird that happened when Terry and Dan were living there. Terry said maybe and asked what she meant, and I guess the new homeowners were having trouble with their young daughter. Her grades were slipping in school, as she was a normally straight-A student. So the teachers called a conference with her parents to let her know she was falling asleep in class all the time. When the parents asked the daughter about it, she said she couldn't sleep at night, because that was when the little girl wanted to play. Terry told her to go around the house and tell them to leave and they'll stop. Never heard anything again about the house after that. There are some interesting things and details to still tell about the house. There was a room on the second floor that had something wrong with it. The room barely got finished, and I believed they turned it into a small spare bedroom. When you were in the room, you'd feel immediately like you needed to leave. And as a kid, if I went into that room, I'd feel anxious. Women mostly felt nauseous or dizzy. My dad and Dan both worked on the room together, but they finished it as quickly as they could. My dad doesn't scare, but even he said the room was weird feeling. Best way I can describe the room is it didn't feel safe to stay there too long, like something could happen to you at any moment if you didn't leave. So I never felt scared in the house, but anxious in that one room. I ran around the house by myself from like six to nine and never felt afraid anywhere else. And I don't really believe in the paranormal, but as a kid, I was superstitious. When we first moved into the area and were house searching, I was three years old. 
This is actually one of my oldest memories. I remember standing in the foyer of that dilapidated mansion and bringing in flowers that I'd picked from outside and setting them on that stair and talking to the ceiling. I don't remember what I said, just that I was doing something nice and whatever I did was appreciated. As a kid, I always attributed that moment to me being accepted by the house. At like age seven on Halloween, my sister and her high school friends played hide and seek in the house and let me play. This was at night, and they left me in the walk-in closet of one of the unfinished rooms in the dark, on an unfinished floor. I was in that closet for probably 15 minutes and never felt scared. No one found me, so I walked out and nothing happened. It's really weird, but as a kid I knew nothing would ever happen to me there or scare me, because of the flower thing. After the night of the two women berating Terry and Dan, hearing the whole thing, my mum and Terry began looking more into the history of the house. My mum actually was the curator of the town's museum, and through land records and old documents, they found out quite a bit about the property's history. Turns out it was built in the early 1800s, and was originally a larger building that had an attached dormitory. It was one of the first girls' colleges west of the Mississippi, and definitely the first in the surrounding area. At some point though, the dormitory attached to the main building burnt down. Later, after the fire, the college became a boarding house due to its size. It stayed that way for a while before either yellow fever or tuberculosis really started to go rampant in the Midwest, and the building then became an infirmary and sort of convalescent home for people seeking treatment and rehabilitation from the disease. Right around the turn of the century, the rest of the buildings on the ground were demolished and the main house was fixed up to be the mansion of a local landowner. It stayed in that family until Terry and Dan bought it. We believe this last family was likely the family of the two women ghosts. The guy who owned the place and sold it to Terry and Dan was one of the last people who lived there. He had lived on the top floor as a teenager when his grandmother had owned the home. When she died in the 70s, the house was just left to nature, and by the time the couple bought it, no one had lived in the house for nearly 30 years. Here's the cool thing. The man who owned the house knew all the family history, who lived in it, when, who it was passed down to. So the patriarch of the family, an original owner of the home, was his great-grandfather. He was a wealthy landowner, and fixed up one of the biggest Victorians in town to be their family home. He passed away, though, and his widow lived in that house with her daughter for the rest of their lives, something like 30 or 40 years. When the mother passed, the daughter did soon after. I guess they were very close, and the daughter didn't want to stick around without her mother. Well, you can guess what happens next. When Terry and Dan approached the man who sold the house, and asked him about the short old woman, and described the homely lithe features of the young woman, the guy immediately knew who they were talking about. He told him that's just his great-gran and great-aunt. He got a kick out of it. They asked him why he never told them the place was haunted. He went on to tell them he didn't believe any of the ghost nonsense and had never experienced anything when he lived there, but that his grandma and great-grandma had always talked about the men in the parlor. And that's how he found out about the front room was a smoking parlor, which we immediately connected to the photos of the men in bowler hats. We never found out who the little girl was. Terry and my mum think she was a victim of yellow fever or tuberculosis when it was being used as a convalescence ward. Also never found out who the hell was haunting the servant's staircase. They seemed to be at peace though, whenever my dad and Dan ripped the staircase out. Nothing weird ever happened on that side of the house after that. My boyfriend of five years has crushed on me for probably 12 or 13 years. You see, he was two grades below me and a bit of a bad boy. While I was popular and in honours slash college level classes, I wasn't aware he even existed until I met him at my dad's business seven years ago. He apparently talked about me being his dream girl and was teased that it would never happen. This is important context to the story. In 2009, he and his best friend, Josh, were getting into pills, 
due to Josh's grandfather being an amputee, and unable to properly attend or understand the need of hiding the medication, thus leaving large amounts of methadone, clompin, and hydrocone and such lying around. This was before the opiate crisis that affected my generation deeply in the last 15 years. Two days before Christmas 2009, Josh overdosed in the bedroom that my boyfriend is currently staying in. The room has never felt spooky, never anything strange about it, but I've had a few pranks pulled on me that we believe Josh does to basically congratulate my boyfriend on being with the woman he oh so patiently waited for. I've woken up to sticky notes completely covering my body, my drinks poured on the floor, and random objects moved right where I exit the bed so that I step on them first thing in the morning. I swear I've heard giggling. Each time I've angrily asked my boyfriend if he was messing with me, and I'm aware when he's lying. He always says no. We like to think it's Josh playing practical jokes, something he was known for. But this is nothing compared to what Josh did for me in 2017, which wasn't a prank, but saved my life. Four years ago, I went into anaphylactic shock and lost the ability to speak or move my lower body. I was upstairs with a curved and steep staircase separating me from my phone. I remember crawling to the stairs, knowing it would be fatal if I smashed into the wall that the stairs led to before the turn, with very large, steep steps. I know that I was extremely oxygen deprived, but I immediately saw Josh and two of my deceased best friends ascending the stairs and carry me to the living room couch with my nebulizer and cell phone. I called 911 but had no voice. My friends were gone except Josh. He told me he was going to wake my boyfriend from the hammock in the back of the yard. And suddenly, my boyfriend dreamed of his friend saying that I was in trouble. My boyfriend came running into the house and by this point I was actually dying. I could no longer use any part of my body and no air came into my lungs. When I inhaled, I remembered thinking of my daughter and praying her father would navigate my loss to her and keep memories of me alive. He actually died in a freak accident eight months ago, so now I'm fulfilling that for him, but I digress. I struggled to remain conscious, but I was fading. My boyfriend saw the 911 operator on the phone and my sweaty blue body. He told me he didn't think I was breathing and by some absolute miracle there was an ambulance passing my neighborhood. The hospital and dispatch were half hour away. This coincidence, plus my boyfriend's sudden premonition that I was hurt, saved my life. Josh and those EMTs saved my life. I remember the EMTs asking my boyfriend if I had overdosed, but I hadn't, and I thought of how Josh had died. I was babbling about how dead people were saving me after a large amount of epinephrine, so no wonder they thought I was high. The doctors and EMTs were baffled at how I managed to get down those stairs, or even stay alive long enough to get help. I had one bruise on my leg that was tiny, and that was it, and the worst headache I've ever had. Turns out I'm allergic to the latex in spray paint. I told them I just slid down the stairs, but that's not how I remembered it. The weird thing is I'd never met Josh when he was alive. I don't know how I recognized him or hallucinated him, but he looked exactly like the picture I was shown. I've had a few paranormal encounters, but my run-ins with Josh saved my life and he never even knew me. So thanks, Josh, for giving me more time on this earth, and I wish we had met many years before. I do hope he's resting peacefully, just periodically popping in to check on us. We lived in a house where things have always just been kind of weird. Every single one of my friends and family who was the slightest bit intuitive, 
I am more the women who are more accustomed to being on guard than my uncles or dad, and are very out of touch with emotions, independently expressed that our house, particularly the part of the basement that was fully underground, felt wrong. There's a decent amount I could share, but anyway, here's the story. First, you need to know the layout, that's important. The house had the main floor over a basement that partially opened up to the outside, on the back side of the house, and one other side. I had a bedroom in the basement, with a window facing the woods. We owned the 19 acres the house sat on, and on the ground floor there was a deck, which stretched over where the basement opened to the backyard slash woods. So from the basement, you exited the backyard under the deck. This deck was accessible outside from the ground, and you could access it from the inside of the house via the living room and primary bedroom. A lot of weird things happened. Like the knocking, there were always knocking sounds on the basement glass doors and windows. My friends heard it too. We always felt like we were being watched. It was deeply unsettling, and the further you went into the basement, the more evil it felt. I know it sounds cliche to say evil, and maybe it was just the primal discomfort of being underground, but something really felt bad back there. The knocking felt intelligent. There were no trees or bushes near the house to cause it, and the knocking moved from window to window, or glass door to glass door. While it did sometimes knock on one of the windows upstairs, because most of those windows were on the deck, it mostly stayed downstairs. It was always three to five knocks at a time. It felt like it was taunting me. It happened more when my parents were not home. They never heard the knocking, but my friends all did when we would be home alone. But fine, maybe this was a person with bad intentions for a teenage girl, a human stalker. I don't really believe in the paranormal, actually. However, this experience is what I keep circling back to, and it really makes me doubt all the other weird things I've experienced too. I was downstairs in my room one night. The knocking was much worse this time, but there wasn't any reason why, e.g. the weather was normal and calm. The dog, feeling the weird vibes, was lying protectively on my legs and facing the doorway. He felt uncomfortable enough that he would go on patrol of the house occasionally, and he would bark and growl at the knocking. Suddenly I hear big, heavy footsteps on the deck upstairs. It was so distinctive. I could even tell you that it was a man, and that it sounded like heavy cowboy boots. Heavy, like the steel toe kind, but of course, you can't know for certain they're steel toe. Cowboy boots are also not uncommon in this rural community in southwestern Missouri, Jasper, and Newton counties. My dog launched off me and raced upstairs, and I could hear him in front of the windows and glass deck making sounds I've never heard him make. I thought it was just an intruder, so I was very glad that my big dog might scare him off. The thing is, though, I never heard the footsteps leave the deck. I call my mum after my dog calms down enough to come back to me, still on edge. I ask if I should call the police. What's the point? If they take over an hour to arrive, I thought. We call a neighbour to drive over and have a look around, but says he didn't see anything and left. I opt to stay upstairs in my parents' bedroom. Again, the bedroom had access to the deck via a glass door. The glass has a privacy film over it to blur the details. I'm sitting on the bed, facing the door on my phone, and my dog is, again, lying protectively on my legs when he's not getting up to patrol the house. He's very on edge, and I'm starting to calm down when I hear him growl. It's not the typical growl I hear when, for example, a strange man comes over, a man I know but the dog doesn't like. It was more primal. I look up, and what I see terrifies me. There's a face in the window. Except, it doesn't have a face. It's pressed up against the glass and I can make out a white person coloured face, but I see no contours of any facial features. That's the thing that scared me most. 
Yes, there was a privacy blurring film on the window, but I should have been able to make out light and shadow, where there should be eyes or nose or a mouth, but there was none. It was short too. It didn't turn away. It very slowly backs away and I can't explain why, but I get the feeling that it wanted me to see it and only left once it knew I had. There was another experience I suffered in the house. This was when there was a young child living with me. At first, she had a room in the basement. The room was kind of midway through the basement. The half of the basement that opened up to the outside felt tolerable, but the further back you went, the worse the basement felt. I always chalked it up to the primal fear of being underground. So this child's bedroom connected to the storm shelter and another bedroom that was deep underground. This child really fought sleep. I mean, kids fight sleep, but it got so bad we moved her to a bedroom upstairs because she would always complain about the shadows. I tried explaining to her the concept of what shadows are. We left night lights, but she was still so scared of the shadows. I've never known what she meant, and her early life was traumatic, so now she doesn't remember anything before like age 10, so she's never been able to articulate her experience. It's hard for me to know whether it was normal five-year-old stuff, like being scared of the dark, or if something was tormenting her. She lived with us because her life circumstances were not right, so it was also harder to tell what was what trauma and what was five-year-old stuff and what was abnormal. She did get better when we moved her upstairs though. Another time I was sleeping on the couch in the basement. There's a hallway behind where the couch is that goes into the deeper part of the basement. The hallway is a straight line with bedrooms on either side in the deep part of the basement before opening out to a wider space where the couch and living area were. I was laying on the couch facing away from the hall when I heard something fall in the back bedroom. I just feel something walk in the living area. It kind of pauses there behind me and I feel paralyzed. I didn't see anything, but the vibes I got were, again, a tall, skinny white man with dark hair. I felt afraid, but not like it was going to hurt me. I started singing hymns and I felt it leave. There was something else, but it isn't my story to tell, and involved of any vulnerable person. There's also a time that my friend and I went skinny dipping in my pool one night. We heard some strange things, and we all agreed it did not feel like an animal. It was too big, and didn't move like an animal. We all watched the whole night, generally really uncomfortable. I do think we might have seen a camera in the woods though, so it is possible that there were just people living out there. I heard people partying sometimes, but could never discern where exactly the sound was coming from. This is the thing. Some of these things could be explained by people, physical phenomena, or just a really strong electromagnetic field giving me the strange vibes. But the only thing that makes sense, that I can rationalize for the faceless thing, is that I also had a neighbor who turned out to have a thing for teenaged girls. So maybe I just had a stalker. There was also a room in the back of the basement I never went in if I could help it. Nothing happened in there. I just never felt comfortable and hated it. When I first moved in, some friends and I were downstairs when we all heard a very strange sound, like scratching on the wall. We'd felt strange the whole time, but ignored it until this point. I even checked things out, like ley lines or whatever, and the house isn't on one. The previous family who built the house were very Christian, so no occult activity. Sometimes I still doubt what I saw with the faceless face, because it was just so bizarre. When I was younger, about five years old or so, my family lived in an older three-story house in a small town in Michigan. My memories have blurred a bit as we moved away halfway through my kindergarten year, but I do remember there was something odd about that house, and I still occasionally have creepy dreams surrounding that house. 
though they have been growing infrequent as of late. My family was, at least at the time, the nuclear family. Mum, Dad, myself, and my older sister by five years. My parents both worked at a local juice factory on different shifts. This night, my mother was out at work, and my father was watching my sister and me. We were making some popcorn in the kitchen to go with the movie we were watching. It had all the makings of a fun evening with my dad. It did not quite happen that way, however. The kitchen was big, and it had a window door that opened into our laundry room, which in turn had a door to the backyard. My sister had walked over to the laundry room door, and my dad was over the stove to the right of the door. I was entering the kitchen from the dining room, which was between the living room and the kitchen. Suddenly terrified, my sister screamed as she passed by the door and promptly ran over to my dad. At this point, I had made it to the kitchen, and as any five-year-old would be, I was curious what scared my big sister so much. In the process, Dad had taken her back to the door as she was saying she saw something in the window that scared her, though it wouldn't be until years later that I learnt exactly what that was. My dad was attempting to calm her down, assuring her there was nothing there, and what she saw must have just been a trick of the mind. That was when I saw it myself. Looking up at the window, there was a strange, red tinge to the reflection cast through the kitchen from the dining room, at least at first. Then suddenly the light morphed into what I can only describe as a giant, disembodied, demonic head that looked to be made of flames. My eyes widened as the thing seemed to tilt its head down and look at me, and then simply grinned. I of course freaked out, lost it, and screamed in terror for my dad too, Eventually we calmed down and made it through the rest of the evening and started off to bed. I remember this part even more vividly than the first encounter, though I was pretty worked up and may have honestly made the next part up in my head, but it does not change what I saw when we turned in. I shared a room and some bunk beds with my sister, and there was a small bathroom attached. The toilet was just inside the door to the left, with just enough space for someone to stand by and be out of view if they desired. This is important because I laid down and grabbed my blankets. I saw a pointed, red, dark tail with a point. You know, the typical ones used in pictures of the devil, just twitching up and down. As I was lying, just waiting inside the bathroom. I said nothing, and quietly turned over and did my best to go to sleep, hoping whatever it was would just go away. I also recall this other night, my sister and I shared an upstairs room, and after settling into bed, I looked out of our bedroom to the short hallway that ran between our room and our parents' room at the end of the hallway. There was a window outside that always had some light shining through it. Seeing as we lived in town, on the ceiling in the hallway, there were odd, moving shadows like water flowing over it. I admit it's entirely possible that it was raining, and I was just being a frightened kid. But I do remember being terrified anyway, and when my mum came to comfort me, she said it was just dust on the ceiling. I never really thought much about it then, but now I just wonder if she produced a random explanation to calm me down. Within the last few years, I would learn more from my family. We were talking about weird experiences and the topic of the house came up. My sister's terror had been due to her seeing her recently dead cat in the window. The story was the cat got into some rat poison and died, making me wonder though. My mum also said that my sister and I were always scared of that place and could not stay upstairs due to our fear. She would also mention that at some point while my parents were sleeping, my dad started sleep talking, then rolled over and her own description and she doesn't make up these sort of things, is that his eyes were glowing red, and she had to yell and smack him around to get him to wake up. I can't remember much else from that house, but it really stuck with me, and I have to wonder if there are any more memories of that place that are buried deep in my mind. This didn't happen to me, 
but it happened to a friend of mine. My friend's name is Willow, and this story happened when she moved into a new house. Her house was surrounded by woods and some old abandoned houses. As soon as she moved in, she started noticing weird things happening. It was usually small, almost unnoticeable, and you could only notice if you were really looking for them. It started off as only a few things going missing, which you would assume she just misplaced them. Then it moved to bigger instances, such as doors locking behind her. She was always creeped out and considered moving, but her parents always brushed it off as her imagination. Doors would slam, pictures would move, the stove would turn off and on, or she would wake up to see a shadow moving out of the corner of her eye. On the last occurrence, it was around 2.30 in the morning, and she woke up. She didn't know why she woke up, but she did. She sat up and looked around her room, and noticed a figure standing slightly inside of her doorway. Naturally, she planted her ass right on her bed, and didn't move an inch, which was the smartest thing to do. She stared at the figure for a few minutes, until she heard light tapping sounds, like when someone drums their fingers on a desk. She tensed up, and this is where things get crazy-ish. This part sounds a bit stereotypical, I know, but all of a sudden she jerks out of bed. She doesn't see anyone because it's dark, but she feels hands on her head. Her hair is getting pulled, and she tries to scream but no noise comes out. She thrashed around, but suddenly she couldn't move. She got pulled all the way out to the living room, where whatever dropped her on the ground. And as she was looking in the darkness, a grey, strange face peered over her, grinning wide as hell. The mouth suddenly snarled and lunged towards her, and then, as the faces were right next to each other, about to touch, she woke up gasping in her bed. Safe to say she moved out of that house and stayed with her friend for two weeks before she moved in with her aunt. She was 16 then, and is now 18. Her parents still live in that house, but she hasn't visited once. I grew up in a house built in the 1860s in upstate New York, with zero problems. Then we bought this fixer-upper house, in Virginia, built in the 80s. And let me tell you, I love scary stories, but I've never encountered so many creepy things as I have in this house. First off, two years ago, I was nursing my son at 2 a.m. in my bed. My boyfriend always seemed to wake me up with the baby during his infant days and would just keep us company on his phone while our son ate. We were both very awake that night, just chatting a little, and the dogs were sleeping in the living room when suddenly, we heard the dog's feet on the wooden floors, excitedly panting. Mind you, these are dogs who usually bark if someone enters the house who doesn't live there, and we both heard a man's voice mumbling in our kitchen, as if he was greeting our dogs. My boyfriend looks at me shocked, and then springs up to check, as I'm petrified, but he sees nothing in the entire house. The next occurrence happens a few months later, I'm alone in our large bedroom, just putting things away and tidying up before going to bed. As I turn off the light switch, my boyfriend walks into the room, so he passed right by me. I didn't look straight at him, but I greeted him while turning down the covers. Still no answer. Still sidetracked with plugging in my phone and such, I ask him if he's going to bed, as he was over on his side of the bed standing. He doesn't answer, but I wasn't looking at him. He likes to joke around with me, so I straight up asked, Are you mad with me right now? As I finally looked up, he ducks down by his side of the bed, and I seriously thought he was picking up something our son had thrown there. I asked the same question again. Then, my actual boyfriend walks into the room and goes, Who are you talking to? I had chills over every inch of my body. He just shook his head like, You're nuts, girl. Since then, there have been a few smaller things that have happened. My son's toy went off in the living room once with no one around it, and one morning my boyfriend came home from the night shift, and our laundry basket was in the middle of the kitchen. 
He thought I'd moved it before bed, but I assured him I had no reason to do so. The reason I'm sharing this now is that I was just cooking in the kitchen and heard whistling from behind me. And earlier today, I heard a human adult cough upstairs, and I'm freaking out. My neighbor is friends with the previous owner's first wife, and she used to live in our home. While she was visiting, I took the opportunity to ask if she'd ever experienced anything in the home. She laughed and said, Oh yeah, that's just Jimmy's brother, Jimmy being her ex-husband. I finally felt so validated knowing I'm not crazy. About 20 years ago, my two children and I rented an apartment. This apartment was on the top floor of a home built in 1910. Everything was fine at first, until after a few nights, once we had settled in for some sleep, I thought I was dreaming about my children, but woke up, their noises very much real. I went to check on them, but they were both asleep, yet the noises persisted. I managed to get back to sleep, but the sounds resumed. I would hear footsteps running across the ceiling, giggling, and laughter. The next day I went to the attic to check things out, but found nothing out of place that was very bizarre. That night the sounds came back. A few days later, I met my downstairs neighbours, so I asked them about it. The whole building was allegedly haunted by multiple entities. For them, they would have their lights shut off, their faucet turn on and be left running, as well as the apparitions of shadow figures. So we just accepted it. At the time, I'd also experienced my fair share of paranormal activity from my own family. This went on for a while, until we moved into a home I'd bought. It would appear that one of these spirits managed to come with me. We ended up naming it Nout, and now if something goes missing, we kindly ask him to return it. We'll wait a few minutes, and it'll appear somewhere obvious. The cats adore Nout as well. At least, those other kids that haunted the attic stayed behind in that apartment. I had just returned from San Francisco, and could not shake that something happened to me at City Lights Bookstore. It's a staple of the beatnik culture. Lawrence Ferlinghetti opened the store in the 50s, and it still attracts people with its poetic charm. My first visit was last weekend, and I was on the second story in the poetry room, when I felt someone tug my hair. I had it in a low ponytail. I thought it was my boyfriend, maybe signalling that he wanted to exit. I shrugged it off as kind of rude, and kept looking at the spines of the books atop of the shelves. All of a sudden, he grabbed my pony and wrenched my head to the left. I began yelling. I was very annoyed. Stop! What's your- I stopped mid-sentence, because I saw my boyfriend was across the room. There was no one else in the room with us. I was completely dumbfounded. I tried to shake it off, but I went to check my books out and pay my tab, and asked the bookkeeper if this place was haunted. She replied with a very firm, yes, but even more unsettlingly, she adds that the activity had gotten much more apparent since the seance they performed a month prior. My skin gets chills just thinking about it. What could have this been besides a haunting? Does anyone have any rational explanations for me? This didn't happen to me personally, but my parents when they initially started dating, and always remained skeptics even after their encounter. My mum was living with my grandparents, and was getting ready to go out on a date with my dad, as they had just met. She let him in the house, told him to sit in the lounge, and that she was going back upstairs to finish drying her hair, and that she would be right back. My dad sat on the chair in the lounge, and to the right of him could see the door straight into the kitchen. The door was wide open, so no reflections, 
and he could see a man standing in the sink, no less than ten feet away from him, quietly leaning at the sink, seeming like he was washing up. My dad was a bit shy initially, and as the man didn't acknowledge him, he just sat patiently waiting for my mum. When my mum returned, my dad quietly asked, Who's that man in the kitchen? My mum shook her head, perplexed, and said they were all alone. Bear in mind, the stairs are in the kitchen, and my mum would have seen them on the way down if anyone was in there. They shrugged it off and thought nothing more of it. A few weeks later, my dad was looking at some of my mum's family photos, and spotted one of her granddad and said, Oh, that's him, the bloke who was in here the other week at the sink. My mum asked him if he was sure, to which he said he was. My mum was in shock and revealed that her grandfather had died a few years earlier, and that is the person he claimed to have seen that evening. When I was six years old, my family was helping my grandmother move out of her apartment. When we were all done, my mother asked me to go get my red zip-up hoodie. I had left it in the back room and went through the entryway of the house past the kitchen and living room down the hall to the bedroom I left my jacket in. It wasn't there. I found the ivory crocodile figurine that my grandmother gave me in the bathroom. Then I walked through the hall as I passed the living room again. I saw my jacket in the middle of the floor and froze. There were six shadows walking around my jacket in a full circle. I was terrified and didn't know what to do. They must have made two full circles before I finally found some courage to move and turned towards the front door and started running. I swear I could feel them all stop and turn towards me and I could feel someone trying to stop me running but I kept going. Once I got out of the house I ran to my mum crying. She said she believed me and that we had to leave right away, which is what we did. When I was younger, my uncle owned a really big house. One day I was home with his dogs, my grandmother and her friend, and they were sunbathing by the pool, and asked me to get something from inside the house. I went in and got the item, and since it was hot outside I decided to take a little walk around. Then when I was about to turn a corner of a hallway, I saw a shadow of a foot. The lighting made no sense because it was just a silhouetted foot, like it was about to step into the hallway. I was so shocked and thought I was tripping out until my uncle's dog barked then went to chase after it. He came back from the other way of the hallway, looking confused, like he couldn't find out whatever it was we just saw. I was so scared I went to ask my grandma if anyone else was here or if she'd invited someone but she said she hadn't. I didn't explain what happened because I didn't think they'd believe me, but the fact the dog saw it too was all I needed to know that I wasn't going crazy, and I genuinely saw something. Let me take you back almost a decade, when I was around six or seven. At the time, I lived, and still do, with my grandparents, in a two-bedroom single trailer with an additional room added on. One night, as I slept with my little sister and my mum in the same bed, I suddenly awoke, heart racing, believing I had just emerged from a nightmare. Upon sitting up, I observed a peculiar short shadow figure in the room. The hallway illuminated its path as it transformed and moved, with its head resembling a sideways lemon swaying side to side as it glided towards me. Terrified, I sought refuge under the covers and urgently called for my mum. The next encounter happened at my cousin's house. While in the attic, all my younger cousins could see the same shadow figure that the adults could not. It was aggressively slamming doors and accelerating upon noticing me. After that incident, it vanished right until December of 2020. In the midst of an incident that triggered my depression, being alone at home at the age of 15, 
a dark feeling compelled me to leave the house immediately. Looking down the hallway, the darkness intensified, prompting me to run outside, pray, and find solace. Since then, I felt a constant sense of being watched at my grandparents' house. Fast forward to the fall of 2021. In the additional part of my grandparents' trailer, I glimpsed an orange-slash-red figure outside, no knees, calves, or head, resembling a corpse. Opening the door, expecting my grandfather, I found no one. In 2022, my grandparents got a new trailer in the same location. Alone every day gave me a feeling of dread, especially in my grandmother's room, leaving me to avoid it. My mum, little sister and I began seeing a lady in a long white dress, or shadow entity, in our peripheral vision. Recently, the trailer now flipped, brought a chilling encounter. I spotted the orange figure again, the entire body visible, seemingly gliding. Terrified, I shook uncontrollably and nearly cried. After calming down, I returned to the kitchen only to witness another figure, entirely black with white eyes, standing in the same gliding posture. The house is near an abandoned home, and a nearby neighbour passed away. I'm uncertain if these events are at all related, but I'm hesitant to return home. When I shared my experiences with my grandmother, she advised me to pray. But I thought I'd ask all of you, what should I do? My husband, son and I, just moved to a new apartment almost a month ago. Everything has been fine here so far, except the fact that I have bad dreams nearly every night about my husband, like that he hates me. But anyway, I've had unexplainable scratches on my arms showing up. I figured that I was scratching myself in my sleep. Well, that was until tonight. My husband was sitting at his gaming desk playing his games. I was standing beside his desk, just talking when I felt a burning sensation on the back of my right upper thigh. I look and there was a scratch. I wasn't wearing any pants, just a t-shirt and underwear, so I figured I somehow scratched myself on something. It was a super long scratch coming across my upper thigh and under my butt. I showed my husband and we both said it was weird and not a big deal. Then I feel the sensation again. I look and there's another scratch, above the first, on my lower right butt cheek. It wasn't there 30 seconds earlier. I never left the spot. So I go get a better look, look in the mirror, and show my husband again. He also says it was not there when I showed him the first scratch, and I'm confused at this point. Still haven't sat down, didn't go anywhere, but to the bathroom to check out the scratch, and back to standing beside his desk. That's when I feel the burning again. I run back to the mirror, and on top of my right butt cheek, there are multiple scratches, like four, maybe five marks together in a row. That freaked me out, because it looked like an animal or person did it. I wasn't scratching myself on the corner of something or walking around the house, plus the fact that my body didn't touch anything since I discovered the first scratch and I'm not the kind of person to blame anything on the paranormal, but I'm having a hard time explaining what the hell just happened, and I could use a hand with coming up for a reasonable explanation for the phantom scratches. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I do hope that you enjoyed tonight's collection of scary stories. If you did, you know what to do. I'd like to give a huge thanks as always to my amazing members and patrons whose names you can see on screen. Thank you guys so much. There are a few perks for signing up if you're interested in finding those out in the description. More videos can be seen by following the links on screen now. But until then, stay awesome and I'll see you in the next one.